Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us today and welcome. Today's webinar session is called Creating and Sustaining Financial Well-Being. We hope today's conversation will be thought-provoking, educational, and will leave you with some concrete strategies for how to create and sustain financial well-being for you and for those you serve. NCADB is honored to partner with the National Endowment for Financial Education, NEFI, to provide this third installment in a series of six free webinars to provide essential financial literacy skills, like building a strong financial foundation and making plans for the future. Before we start, I invite you to please take a moment to locate the questions box on your control panel. You can see the screenshot for more information on how to locate it. Due to the number of people on this webinar, it is possible that we will not be able to get to all questions, but we will be sure to cover as many as we can throughout. That said, this webinar is full of opportunities to engage, answer questions, and reflect on today's topic. We encourage you to actively participate throughout the webinar. In order to interact or to participate in any of the interactive activities, type your responses into the questions box. Also, a quick reminder that a copy of the PowerPoint, a certificate of participation, as well as several really great financial education handouts can be found in your control panel under handouts. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will send that recording to you along with all of the handouts in a follow-up email that will come out 24 hours after today's session. Also, at the end of the session, we have a, a quick five-question survey for you to fill out. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Firstly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sheba McCants, and I'm the Outreach Director for NCADV. And today, I'm joined by Jeanette Schultz, Director of Financial Workshop Initiatives for NEFI. All right, so before we begin today's webinar, we have a series of polls that we'd like for you all to participate in, and that really is in order for us to get to know you, today's webinar audience. So let's get ready to get interactive. Why don't we go ahead and launch our first poll? Who is participating today? So go ahead and select how you may identify yourself. Are you an advocate? Are you a victim or a survivor? Are you a case manager? If you have a, a other, go ahead and indicate that in the questions box. We like to see who's on the webinar today. Let's get some more votes in. I like to see it at least 80% of our webinar audience voting. So let's get more votes in. This is a really interesting group today. I'm loving to see that. Okay, let's go ahead and close that up. Right, so it looks like 67% of you have indicated that you're either a domestic violence or a sexual assault advocate. 24% are case managers or counselors. We've got 16% other, so I want to read some of those job titles. So we've got a program director. We do have a financial institution. Welcome. Thank you. A community engagement specialist or a prevention educator. Several victim advocates, coalition staff, dual state coalition staff. Awesome. Let's go ahead and go to our next poll. Where are you located? We like to um, get a sense for where people are tuning in to today's webinar from. So go ahead and indicate where you are located. Let's get as many votes as we can. We are tuning in today from Denver, so the mountain region. So representing the mountain region this morning. All right, we can close that one up. Great. We have about, we have 42% of you joining in from the East Coast, 20% from the Midwest, We've got 19% from the, our southern states in Puerto Rico, 14% from the West Coast, Alaska, or Hawaii, and then we've got 5% from the mountain region. Let's go to our next poll. What is your racial or ethnic identity? And you are able to select multiple answers here. Thank you all so much for your participation. Right at the beginning of the webinar, we like to you know, start out interactive and keep it interactive throughout, so thank you. All right, that looks pretty solid. Let's close that one up. All right, so 65% of our webinar audience today is white or Caucasian. We have 19% for both Black, African American, African or Caribbean, as well as Hispanic or Latinx. And then we have 5% American Indian or Alaska Native and 4% Asian or Pacific Islander. 
Let's go ahead and launch our next poll. This one I'm really always very curious about. How would you define your community type? Would you define it as urban, suburban, or rural? Go ahead and indicate that in the poll right, right now. I see those numbers just flying in. Exciting. Very good. All right, we can close that one up. That was a quick vote. Good job. Thank you. 46% of today's webinar audience are tuning in from rural communities. Another 23 from suburban communities and 30% of our webinar audience is tuning in from urban communities. Thank you so much. And our final poll for today. Is this information for you or for those you serve? And you could totally pick both. I think this particular topic, I, I really hope that you all are going to use this information not only for those you serve, but also for you. I think this information is really relevant to anyone that is tuning in. So go ahead and let us know what you think. All right, we can close that up. That looks fair. 70% have indicated that the information is for both themselves as well as for those they serve. That's excellent. Thank you so much. And then 28% are saying that they have clients who need this information. Wonderful. Great. Thank you all so much for that awesome feedback. It's really helpful for us to know who is in, in the room, quote unquote, with us today. We really appreciate that. Great, Sheba. Let's take a moment to go through today's agenda on creating and sustaining financial well-being. We know that your time is so valuable and we want to be sure you are getting what you came here for. And to that point, we want to be very clear about what you can expect to learn to, during today's session. We have four specific outcomes that we will go over during today's webinar session. Each section will have an opportunity for you to learn, reflect, and interact. The four agenda items for today's webinar sessions are the following. One, what is financial well-being? Two, why do we make the financial decisions we do? Third, what is behind our money values? And last, strategies and systems for financial well-being. Excellent. So on today's webinar, we're, really, we're going to be focusing on three key areas. And throughout, there will be sort of, there will be opportunities for you to interact and reflect and um, really make this information personal to you. But I want to do a brief overview before we get into more specifics of those three key areas. So the first area we're going to cover is sort of defining what is financial well-being. This, um, I find that this is maybe not something, maybe not a term that we use every day, but the way that we think about it is having control over our finances, being able to absorb a financial shock, and also being on track to meet your financial goals. So we'll talk more about what financial well-being is, but that, that's a real nice brief overview. The second key area is about the financial decisions we make. Sometimes these decisions can be based on facts or logic. Often they're based on our needs, our wants, and our quote-unquote shoulds. The decisions we make can also be influenced by hidden messages or external pressures. So, and, and we'll go, we will go more into depth about why we make the financial decisions we make, but that's a nice brief overview. And our last of the three key areas is talking about our values around money. We break them down into four types of values. We've got our inner values, our social values, our physical values, as well as our financial values. And these values, they, they're not stagnant. They do change over time. And our values certainly do affect our habits around money. So that's kind of the overview of the three key areas. All right, so which of the three key areas are you most familiar with or would you say you think about most often? So this is, this is an opportunity for you actually to reflect on this question, and you can go ahead and type that into the questions box. Which of the three key areas are you most familiar with? Do you think most about the decisions you make, the financial decisions you make? Do you think about your financial well-being? Are you thinking most about your values around money? Go ahead and type your reflection into the questions box. Wonderful, I see a lot of people participating. I always love to see that. So many of you are saying that you're, you think most about the financial decisions you make. Yeah, I can, I can totally see that because I think that's, 
that's what plays out in, in real life. Maybe we're not thinking about our values. Although they may be impacting us, we may not be thinking about them every day. We hope to maybe bring some of that to the surface today. Let's get some more people participating. Oh, wow, lots of people. Financial well-being is another really popular response. Good, so I'm glad that folks are thinking about that, and that's really what, what we're here to talk about today. And uh, so I hope that we can give you some, some real good tidbits around how you can even improve that, what you're, uh, improve upon what you're already doing. Wonderful. Let's go on. Great, so what is financial well-being? This is the first item on today's agenda. And we want to give you a definition of what we find. Financial well-being is not necessarily a commonplace term, so let's start out by defining what it means. As a financial educator, I find that we talk more often about the challenges we have with the managing our money. What we, what we often do not discuss is what a healthy relationship with money looks like. This webinar is meant to be reflective and interactive, so before we bring the spotlight back to you and encourage you to think about your unique financial needs, let's read a definition of financial well-being from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB. They published a report in 2015 focusing on financial well-being, defined as a state of being where you, point A, have control over day-to-day, -day, month month-to-month finances, Next point, have the capacity to absorb a financial shock. That could be a car breakdown, an appliance repair, a health care diagnosis. Another point is, are you on track to meet your financial goals of retirement, college for your kids, building a business? And point, the last point, have the financial freedom to make the choices that allow you to enjoy life. And now let's take this first opportunity of today's session to reflect on our own financial well-being. Take a moment to type out whether your working definition of financial well-being or complete this sentence. I will know when I am in a state of financial being when blank, blank, blank. What does that mean for you? Does it mean that you can retire uh, fully and not worry about making another paycheck? Does it mean that you can take a vacation and not worry about how much that vacation is going to cost? Does it mean having no credit cards? While you're thinking about your answers, I want to mention three things. Wealth, income, and possession. It is a common misconception that your income level and material possessions define your wealth. However, a person with a large income might live paycheck to paycheck with an expensive lifestyle that limits his or her ability to accumulate wealth. Wealth isn't defined by how much money you earn. It's about how you grow and save your money to meet your changing life circumstances. I'm going to take a look at some of the answers. Thank you for answering. Um, when I save more, I have control over my money. Um, when I have enough saved to retire. I don't have to check my uh, checking account every day. I have a six months worth of income and savings. When I don't have to leave from pay, live from paycheck to ch paycheck. I have all my debts paid off. I will know I am in a financial being when I can take a vacation without worrying the cost also. When I'm not living month to month. I have enough finances to cover an emergency and any excess costs at all times. Great. Thank you. All right. So um, I'd like to preface this conversation about creating a path towards financial well-being by saying this. In order to get started on the journey towards financial well-being, you certainly do not have to have it all together. Personally, I know that I didn't. If you're anything like me, you may be able relate to the following. I had tons of unopened bank and credit statements piling up in my garage. I, I definitely had a couple of flips on my credit report from late credit card payments. I, I definitely purchased products that were beyond my means, and I certainly have had credit card debt. 
on top of that, though, I also had a lot of financial fears. I thought, would I be able to afford a trip to visit family? Would I ever be able to move out of my apartment and purchase my own home? I felt uneasy and insecure because I didn't know if I would be able to accomplish the things that I dreamed of doing, and that was because of money. There were moments where I felt out of control, and I didn't know what step to take to change my situation. I worked hard to build confidence in other areas of my life, but when it came to finances, I was really not so self-assured. But today, I have a new story. I've learned ways to take, care, take control of my own finances. I've created new habits around money, and I'm much less afraid to make important choices that impact my future. I've also learned to value and actually enjoy saving money, believe it or not, really, um, as much as I do spending. Really, though, I think both of them have their payoff. For me, the key was building a strong foundation. Here, I'm able to continue moving forward towards financial well-being, security, and fulfillment. So as we're talking about financial well-being, there are three questions that I'd like for you to ask yourself. What do you want your life to be like? How do you want to live? And what choices do you need to make now and in the future? So um, in our webinar three handouts, which is in your handouts in the drop in the uh, handouts drop down on your control panel, we have a future aspirations worksheet, which I think will help you break down some of those big, broad questions into more specifics. I know that for some of us, it may be comfortable to be in the space of this bigger picture thinking, whereas for others, that really may not be helpful at all. As a financial educator, we are here to provide context and tools that you can use as you begin to create your path towards financial well-being. So how do we know if we are in a state of financial well-being? For my number-driven and analytical people, you may be wondering, is this something that can be measured? There are four important factors all outlined on this infographic that provides a snapshot of where you are at time in terms of of financial well-being. Keep in mind these numbers will change, so check in with them periodically. Number one, your net worth. This is really a fancy way to say what you own and what you owe. Number two, your credit score. I just checked my credit score last week, trying to see if I could achieve a, uh, a substantial rating so I could get a great loan. Number three, your short-term emergency savings. Do you have money put away for that uh, setback, maybe a car repair, maybe your uh, dryer broke down? And number four, your investments and long-term savings. Perhaps it's your retirement plan. Of course, you probably won't tackle all four areas at all, but you might find that achieving a level of success in one will lead to improvement of another. Another worksheet in your handout section will help you calculate your net worth. Remember that has to do with what you own, your credit card, and what you owe. What you own is your house, I'm sorry, and what you owe are your credit cards, student loans, all the things that you might have to pay to get your debt down. Now that we have properly defined financial well-being, reflected on what it means to us, and learn how to measure it, let's transition to the next item on today's agenda. Why do you make the financial decisions you do? These reasons very well may apply to you. You could be searching for the choice that will move you away from frustration, fear, or discomfort, and towards peace and calm. Or you could be looking for the option that will make you most comfortable, whether you know it or not, you sometimes choose options that are not good for you because they're easier and cause lots less stress in the moment. Um, a good example of that is probably uh, going out, eating out, because it's easier instead of going home and, and making a home-cooked meal. So let's take a moment to brainstorm who and what has influenced the decision you made about money. Type your ideas into the question box. It could be your parents, it could be your spouse, friends, peers, professors. It could be mentors, teachers, coaches, or maybe groups you belong to, like the Rotary Club, Toastmasters, other organizations. It could be the police force, your neighborhood community group, or it could be just 
social media, TV, the magazine called Money, music, ads, anything that you might see out there. Thank you for answering. I see a lot of people saying parents, mentors. Parents seems to be a big answer. My mom, my mother-in-law. Um, parents and mom was careless, so I wanted to change my lifestyle. Thank you for that. Mostly the financial abuse heaped on my, on me by my ex-husband. Struggling with money through college really influenced how I view and handle money in my life now. Books. I know that I've read books all the time, and I started my career as a financial reporter because all I wanted to do is read about money. Little did I know that I would end up here at NEFI for the last 18 years working on curriculum about money. Great. All Lots right. of good answers. Sheba. Awesome. Thank you, Jeanette. All right, so when we're thinking about the financial decisions that we make, I have a couple more questions for you to ask yourself. What hidden or mixed messages are you receiving around money? Have your decisions been influenced by the pressure to belong? And also, what beliefs around money are you holding on to? So as we're looking through all of your responses in terms of who has influenced the financial decisions that you make, take a moment to consider the hidden messages or mixed messages that you may have heard during childhood. They, they, when you heard them, they became sort of unconscious beliefs, but th those beliefs can later turn into your adult money habits. For example, you may have been told that you should save money, but your experience as a child may, may be that that was impossible. Also, another example is you may have been taught that spending money is a way to self-soothe. We all know that saying, uh, quote unquote, retail therapy, right? But if you're spending money that you intended to go towards your savings, that really could be self-sabotage. So we encounter these types of mixed messages around money all the time. Also, there is that pressure to belong. We've all heard the saying, keeping up with the Joneses. But this can be really tough. You can end up in lots of debt just trying to maintain the lifestyle of your friends or neighbors. Think about it. Have you ever made a purchase for any of the following reasons? Have you purchased something to show off your success? To experience that feeling of instant gratification or feeling that feeling of having what you want right now? Have you purchased something because you saw an advertisement that said you, that said you deserve something that you didn't have? I definitely relate to that. Or maybe because you envied something that someone else had. I think uh, particularly in the era of social media, this idea of the pressure to belong is especially relevant. You know, um, we, we see on social media, you know, and we think, that, we think that if we could only have their success if we owned certain things or had a certain lifestyle, and that can really open us up to potential pitfalls. So, and then you take that, that pressure to belong, and then, and then combining it with the easy access to credit, and this can really cause a lot of problems, and folks may be, may be taking on more debt than what they can handle. Let's take a moment also to reflect on our beliefs about money. So we have on the one hand, as Americans, we're, we're taught that we need to be financially responsible or fiscally responsible. And if we break this rule or even appear to be irresponsible with money, we might feel stressed. We might feel in fear or absolutely feeling a deep feeling of shame as a result. Many of us feel clueless or even a bit detached or ignorant when it comes to our own finances. I know that this was a state that I often was in. I, I sort of had no idea where my money was going. I knew that I would receive money, you know, every two weeks on my paycheck, but, but by the end of like the first week, I, you know, it was gone and I, I sort of didn't know where it was going. So it's, it's this feeling of being a bit detached from your money and, and where it's going. As, as we can see in our questions box, our beliefs around money can be passed down from our parents. Uh, and this can also create, this can often create a cycle of unhealthy money habits within a family. And on the other hand, there's also a lot of pressure for us to buy things as Americans. Just think of all the advertisements that you see in a typical day and bringing up social media again. Often these time, oftentimes these advertisements are specifically catered to things that you've searched out on the internet. So these advertising uh, tactics are becoming even more sort of invasive all the time. Uh, 
in addition, technology is changing so fast. You know, you, you may have just purchased a new phone and then you realize like, a month later that the newest model has already came out. Um, and this pressure to keep up and consume products is a necessity if you want to participate in today's world. So I have um, another opportunity. Let's go ahead and reflect. How are you doing at balancing these two social pressures, financial responsibility and consumer consumption? So we've got some words on, on, the, on the screen there for you to use as you're reflecting. How are you doing with balancing those two really difficult, difficult things, these social pressures, between financial responsibility and consumer consumption. We'd love to hear from you. A lot of folks are saying they need work or, or that they're a work in progress. We got one person saying that they got it covered. And I think that's, that's awesome. It's not an easy balance to strike. A lot of us are in that, in that state of being a work in progress. And I think for me, it kind of comes in waves. Um, once you do develop strong financial habits, it's kind of like fitness, like where if you stop or if you fall off, one good thing is that you can really, you can always get back on. You can always start again. Um, and so I think that's an important thing to know is that falling back on those healthy habits is always an option. And if you kind of stray away and have like, you know, a month or two or even a couple of weeks where you're spending a little more than you think you should, you can always get back on balance. Now that we've taken some time to reflect on why we make the financial decisions, what influences these decisions and define financial well-being? Let's transition to the next item on today's agenda. What is behind our money values? We each come to the table with our own set of values, principles, or standards of behavior about what is most important in our lives. And this is true about our money, too. What you want in your financial future and what you need to feel financially secure depends on your values. Examining your values lets you clearly understand what matters most to you and why you set the goals that you do. The judgments you make begin to reveal patterns in your behavior that are specific to you and your values. And the hard choices you have to make become easier when you remain true to your values and goals. So take a moment to think about the values around money. Use this sentence to sentence prompt to get you thinking about what you value most when it comes to money. When I am making a, a decision about money, whether that means buying a home, taking a vacation, making plans for retirement, or even making an impulse purchase, I tend to value blank, blank, blank the most. It might mean saying I need some me time this week and that might forego making a home-cooked meal. It might mean um, what's most important and impacts my future. Family happiness, family comes first. Personal comfort, return on investment. These are some of the answers I'm getting, thank you. My ability to pay my debt and bills the most. Balancing my life. The ability to cover my monthly bills first. Great, thank you. Family, family is a, con uh, a constant. Maximizing savings, needs for, rather than wants. Great, well there's others that have confessed they, they do like instant gratification and I think that's, um, that's uh, all for everybody. Bills first. While you're brainstorming, I want to share a resource called the Life Values Quiz. It is 20 questions. The Life Values Quiz is based on academic research and reveals what's behind a person's financial decisions. We encourage you to check out this tool and more at smartaboutmoney.org, and we will talk more in depth about what the Smart About Money website has to offer later in this webinar during this section on strategies and systems. I have to admit, I made my two daughters, they're 15 months apart, do the life values quiz. And I did find out as a parent that one was a spender and one was a saver. So we really had to work on the spender and just last weekend we're still working on the spender's habits because she went off track and my husband was a little bit tired of giving the same lecture again and again. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I can relate to that. Even in my own life, being a spender and now being more of a saver, um, 
and both have their benefits, but I, I certainly feel a lot more secure right now in the position of being a saver. Certainly wasn't, though, growing up. All right, so let's, let's dig in a little bit to our values around money. Let's break down each one. So the first one that we're going to cover is around our inner values. So thinking about even our psychological, our spiritual, those inner life values, they're very personal. Those include our identity in terms of our social identity, how we see ourselves in the community, our need for safety and security, and the other and the many other aspects of the quote unquote real me. So these inner values, they really shape our sense of purpose and meaning in life and the principles by which we live. We all have these types of values and they're really they're rooted in how we see ourselves and how we believe others see us. And these, these inner values, they, they certainly have effects on our money habits. When, when we have strong inner values, this means that we, we're able to trust our gut. So, like, we're able to follow our intuition around money, which can help in terms of if you, if you find yourself in a sudden money crunch. All right, so that's the inner. Let's go to our social values. These have to do with family, friends, and community. A lot of you indicated that family was one of the things that you value most in terms of when you're making a decision about money. And so maybe in this, maybe this is an area that you really value is thinking about how money relates to your social values. So friends, family, community, caretaking, absolutely, children. Maybe you're taking care of elderly parents thinking about budgeting as a couple and sharing expenses. Those are all part of social values. And um, as we mentioned and as we have perceived, how we handle money is connected to our family histories in terms of beliefs that we may have picked up from our childhood, from our parents, our siblings, or other childhood experiences. Our social values also have to do with our how we connect in terms of our peer group. So thinking about org organizations that you're a part of, clubs, cultural or ethnic groups that you may be a part of, or other ways that you're connected in your community, city, or state. These social values, they certainly have an effect on our money habits. So as we mentioned, the, how we think about money is really tied up into our family history, and each of us has a unique history. And um, so we may often pick up habits or cultural rules from our family or other close relationships, possibly intimate partner relationships, as many many people have mentioned in our questions box. And sometimes, um, you know, you may, these beliefs or, or things that you may have picked up from your childhood or relationships may cause unconsciously impact you. So just have, keeping that all in mind. Our physical values, this may not be one that you think about a lot um, in terms of the, the word physical values, but this absolutely impacts us. So thinking about our health and our environment. So these are the tangible aspects of life, uh, the material world, and the, all the elements that we build and create around ourselves in order to promote physical health and well-being. So thinking about what we need in order to feel comfortable, the kind of space we like to be in, and also our desire for possessions. So physical values are about being comfortable in our bodies, in our homes, and in our environment. And um, this one absolutely has an effect on our money habits. If you are a person with strong physical values, this might, you may spend a lot of money on your physical or on your material possessions, but not always. Sometimes uh, our physical values show up in a desire for quality. For example, you may be someone who really values high quality craftsmanship or and someone who appreciates design. I think I, I can relate to this. I think in my own home, I really like, I like everything to look beautiful. It kind of brings me comfort in my, you know, in my own life. So I can certainly relate to this. And also our thinking about what we spend on our own self care, like our gym memberships or our home improvement. So all of these things have to do with our physical values. And then the last, uh, the last set of values are our financial values. So those have to do with uh, financial sufficiency, sustainability, and appropriateness. So um, I do want to point out that having strong financial values doesn't necessarily mean being wealthy or having a lot of financial knowledge. So you could be a person with very little financial means but really be driven by financial values. So I just want to point out that those two are not necessarily uh, always correlated. A person with strong financial values desires accuracy, organization, and discipline. 
that person thinks about getting the best deal. They recognize perks beyond pay, such as a retirement plan or health care. And those might be really important values when they're assessing a job offer. And also, people with, high finan or with a set of financial values, they often enjoy growing their money. So like investment, they, they can really appreciate seeing those, those investments growing. In terms of the effect on money habits, People that have strong financial values can, can mean that you enjoy saving and growing your money. I, I mentioned before that I, I kind of found that joy later on in life, but I really do appreciate seeing my savings accounts grow. And we'll talk a little bit more about saving later on in the webinar. People with strong financial values can be great financial educators, and they often may find themselves in the position of giving advice to family or friends. All right, so now that you've heard that, the education piece, after thinking more about values around money, which of the four do you feel that you tend to prioritize the most? I'm curious to see this and how this breaks down in our, um, in our webinar audience. So go ahead and indicate right there in your questions box, which of the four values do you feel that you tend to prioritize the most? All right, cool. I think we're, we're getting like one of each so far. Uh, and, but a lot of folks are saying that their inner values drive them. So that means like you're, you're able to listen to your intuition. You're able to trust your gut when it comes to making financial decisions, which is, which is excellent. All of these have their benefits. There's not one that's better or worse than the other. We're all just unique. So I'm just curious to see how people, are, how people feel about this. Yeah, a lot of financial values. Very good. Maybe that's what brought you to this webinar, and you just you want to increase your, you know, your aptitude and your skill set around, around money and financial literacy, which is awesome, and that's why we're here as well. Great. It really does vary across the board. Social values are absolutely people that have physical and social values. Great. Thank you. Just as your values influence your financial decisions, so do your needs. You may all be familiar with American psychologist Abraham Maslow and the hierarchy of human needs. Essentially, your lowest and most basic needs must be satisfied before you can move towards satisfying the next level of needs. In Maslow hierarchy, physio physiological needs such as food, water, sleep must be satisfied before moving to safety needs of shelter, safety, and so on. Using a similar approach to Maslow's hierarchy, you can analyze your financial health on five levels of needs, which comes from missionassetfund.org. Shiba, do you think you could just write that down on the... Yeah, I can chat, put that in the chat box. That would be awesome. No problem. So income, can you cover basics like food, housing, and utilities? Insurance, do you have adequate protection of your income, health, and other assets? They could be home renters, disability, long-term care, life insurance. Credit, can you borrow when you need without paying high rates? Are you able to make your payments on time? Savings, can you set aside money for emergency needs or big ticket items? Can you manage if you experience a major change in your income? Are you saving for your retirement? And investments, will you be able to cover your expenses when you retire? Are your current investments, investments feeding inflation? Starting at the bottom of the pyramid, you need to meet your basic income needs before you begin to address insurance needs, credit needs, and so forth. Sometimes you'll need, you'll you will meet needs at a higher level without feeling totally secure at a lower level. When this happens, check in with lower levels, depending on how your life circumstances changes, to make sure you have a strong foundation. Excellent. Now that we have defined financial well-being, we've talked about why we make the financial decisions we do, as well as talked about our values around money, let's transition to the last section on today's agenda, which is strategies and systems for financial well-being. I do notice that a lot of you indicated that you had a, a strong set of financial values, so maybe you were really looking forward to this section because you're looking for tips and strategies. I can totally relate to that. I, I'm always open to receiving more tips and strategies around financial literacy and financial management. So before we dive into more specific strategies, I want to offer an empowering message, which, have, which has to do with giving yourself permission. First and foremost, the path to financial well-being starts by giving yourself permission to want the things you want as well as the lifestyle you want. 
many of us might may be carrying with us a set of negative associations with having money, and that can keep us from actually achieving what we want. The empowering message that we want to share around giving yourself permission has to do with giving ourselves the permission to take care of our own financial well-being. So knowing where you're at in regards to your financial goals, I think that as long as you are happy with where you're at and where you want to go, others' opinions, they won't matter quite as much. Giving your, yourself permission also to say no to requests that don't align with your values or financial priorities. Again, as we've, as we've mentioned and discussed on the webinar, there are many people, organizations, and media messages that are constantly trying to influence our decisions around money. With clarity, you are the best decision maker about what is necessary for your future. You can also give yourself permission to change your mind. If your circumstances change or you have a new idea, you can always adjust your goals. When you align with what you want and what you need to be financially secure with your values, you are taking care of you. So this is where that well-being, it's like financial wellness. Setting your goals for your financial lifestyle in alignment with your values gives you permission to prioritize your financial well-being. Then once you have a good foundation, you can look outward to help others from a position of strength. I think about um, that, that concept of you cannot give from an empty vessel or even the, um, the saying that self-care is not selfish. I think that we have, we have similar uh, struggles around money. We think that maybe if we do accumulate wealth that maybe we're being greedy or things like that. But I think um, we want to kind of flip that and really focus on the idea of taking care of our own financial well-being, which is really important for all of us to do because no one else can really do that for us or no one else can really quite understand our financial situation as well as we can. So in that, in that sense, we really are the expert on our own financial situation. However, I do want to point out also that on our financial um, journey towards financial well-being, we are not alone. There are so many people out there that are qualified and able to, to assist us as we're on our, going along on our financial journey. So that brings us to this next slide, which is about community resources. So thinking about, um, thinking about in addition to having money in the bank, what are some of the resources that we can tap into that can help us support our lifestyle or future needs? So really thinking outside of the box in terms of what are the resources that we may have access to that are not financial? So yeah, thinking about friends, family, or business people who can help you in making your financial decisions. I also want to add in on that piece that there are there are people in the financial community who do offer, you know, qualified financial advice. And these you can often find these people at banks or at credit unions and they're often able to do those things for you at no charge. So really thinking about what are the resources that you can take advantage of that are free of charge. Another really good one is is libraries. I find that libraries have a lot of great resources in terms of financial literacy, and they're always they're also very open in terms of if you think of an idea of some sort of workshop that you need on financial education, you could ask them to offer it, and often they'd be really open to that. Other non-financial benefits are things like life insurance policies, legal help, identity theft protection, or health programs that reward you for positive behaviors. We're definitely seeing a lot of that these days where you can like get money back for going to the gym or things like that, or there are like stipends for purchasing running shoes and things like um, going to the farmer's market. You often see like some benefits and, and um, workplaces contributing to those types of things. So this is really to help you really think outside of the box in terms of the types of resources that are available in your community. And the folks on this webinar, we may also be in the position of providing those resources to the community as advocates. You know, we, as advocates, we wear a lot of many different hats and um, we're not just there for, for, to provide safety and support, but we're often in the position of providing financial advice or advice on finding housing. So keeping in mind that um, there are resources out there to help you further your professional development in this area. So let's give you some resources that we've had here at the National Endowment for Financial Education. SAM starts for Smart About Money, but it also stands for the following. One, 
size up your situation, two, analyze your circumstances, and three, make a plan. SAM is NEFI's consumer-focused website providing American adults with action-oriented e-learning courses on foundational financial concepts. There are seven in-depth courses, including an awesome course on financial well-being. It's about 45 minutes in length if you complete it in one sitting. There are also five other courses on money basics that cover foundational financial concepts like spending slash saving, credit and debt, and insurance. You can go on your own pace. You can access, access them anytime as long as you have an internet connection, perhaps in the library. The site is mobile friendly, so you can access it on your cell phone or tablet if you're waiting in line and you know that you have a long wait. You can register for an account, but it's not required. The benefits of registering, it allows you to save your budgets and bookmark specific web pages that you may want to come back to time and time again. The SAM Financial Wellbeing course objectives are the following, establishing personal financial security well-being based on your personal values and circumstances, analyzing how your money management habits affect your financial security, implementing strategies and systems to realize your own sense of financial well-being. The financial well-being is very in-depth. It gets you thinking about what exactly financial well-being means to you. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of our financial habits. So this list that you're seeing now on your screen, I think is really helpful. And as you're, as you're kind of thinking about that, let me read to you one more time our definition of financial well-being, which is according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. A state of being wherein you have the control over day-to-day, month-to-month finances, have the ability or capacity to absorb a financial shock, and are on track to meet your financial goals and have the financial freedom to make the choices that allow you to enjoy life. So as you're um, considering how to structure your financial habits, definitely keep that definition in mind. I'll break down a few of these points. So thinking about how can you spend less than you earn? And that usually involves bolstering your savings and reducing your expenses. Remember that because you have money doesn't necessarily mean you should spend it. And also because you have something doesn't mean you need it. Save for future spending. Get in the habit. Get yourself into a habit of saving. Start simple. And um, one way that you can do this is by automating your savings or, or investments. And this is something that I have been doing for several years. It was not something that I knew that I could do. But once I started doing it, it it has really added so much value to my life. When you, um, almost all on, online banking systems have the ability where you can do sort of an automatic transfer from your checking to your savings. And if you do that, if, if you set it up on a frequent basis, you know, it's like you almost, you don't even notice that you're doing it. If you don't see the money, then you don't worry about it. So I think it's a really positive habit to implement. If you're not already doing that, we definitely encourage you to, to try that one out and, and see how, how that might change your situation. Only borrow what you can afford. We're not talking about denying ourselves, but we're really, we're really talking about not or avoiding spending for the outward show or status symbol. Whenever you're considering borrowing, take into consideration the loss to your long range goals when you choose to spend now. Remember that every dollar borrowed today is a dollar less to spend tomorrow. Think about how you can grow your money. Again, work with a financial or tax advisor to structure investments so you can gain tax advantages. And even if you're not in the position to necessarily start investing, I still recommend working with a financial advisor to help you start saving or reduce your debt, which, will, which both will help you in terms of the goal of growing your money long term. Boost your earning capacity. This is one that um, maybe a lot of us are doing. Maybe, maybe you have like a side hustle or something that you're doing on the side. Um, Jeanette, Jeanette brought up a good one. Do you want to share what yours is? I thought yours was so interesting. So I used to be, I used to buy books all the time every time I walk into a bookstore. It was just uh, spending $30, $50 a month on books. But then I never read them. 
so it sat in a corner forever. So then when we saw my husband and I does this uh, activity every month, um, whether it ends in argument or whatever, <laughs> it's about our money discussions, we realized that if we could put a kibosh on that, which I felt like, oh, my gosh, you're cutting my leisure, my reading, um, I committed to reading a book and then writing the reviews. So after doing this for three years, I'm already getting publishers contacting me to write the reviews. So now I get free books. But it's it's taken a while to grow that. But it's it's so fun. Now I don't have to spend any money in bookstores because I get the latest books. So I'm excited that that has happened. And it wasn't intentional. It happened just because I was trying to cut that habit. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I thought that was so interesting how you took something you were passionate about and made it into a side hustle. So really cool. Uh, so maybe, so thinking about how you can boost your earning capacity, allowing your interest earning accounts to grow will help you offset any downturns or emergency expenses. A lot of you mentioned when you were defining what your definition of financial well-being is, is having that, that emergency savings. I know that's a big goal for a lot of us. So thinking about how you can boost your income in order to make that goal a reality. And then lastly, protecting what you have. So this not only applies to insurance for yourself, but thinking about your property and income and also your investments. All right, let's take a moment to reflect on your current and past financial habits. So this is another opportunity for you to go ahead and chat into your questions box. How has your relationship with money changed over time? And as you are reflecting, and I will read back some of the responses that I get, consider, you may want to think about when you were a young child, did financial matters get discussed in your family? Were you ever told that something cost too much or was too expensive? And how did you feel in general about your, fi your family's financial standing as a child? And what about now in your current life or in your current relationships? Do you have input on financial matters? Are your values represented in the financial decisions that are made for you and your family? And how do you feel about how money is being used in your current relationship? I'm going to take some time and read back some of these answers. Someone said, I love the definition of financial well-being that you were saying. Can you? Um, yes, I can type that. I'll type that in for you in just a moment. But yes, um, people are saying, I have a lot of guilt and shame. I started taking control of my money and started, instead of it controlling me. Awesome. Saving and not spending matters. I spent carelessly when I'm when I was younger. Now I'm in my 30s and I'm looking more long term. Ooh, I definitely relate to that. I feel like you know financial literacy is not something we always get taught per se. It's definitely not something I was taught as a young person. So as I've gotten older, it's become a necessity. You know, I think just as just in the ways that we realize, you know, um, we're not going to be young forever. We have to take care of our bodies. I think we have to also think about our financial situation the same it's in order for it to be healthy we have to contribute to that and we have to make that effort I'm becoming more aware of money and spending habits great oh my goodness we have a just a wealth of responses a lot of them are around shame and um, what they learned when they were being when they were raised from a young age and there was a lot of shame around money which I can totally relate to and maybe today's webinar will be empowering in some way to, to know that you do have some capacity and definitely some power in terms of um, taking taking some of that control from a from a standpoint of financial literacy and from a standpoint of education. Uh, there's a lot that you can do, and I certainly encourage you all to really use some of these resources, like the Smart About Money Financial Wellbeing course. I think is fantastic, and will really sort of emphasize what we've talked about today. So let's talk about habits that build financial well-being. Feeling in control of your finances is key to financial well-being. To establish this control, Smart About Money or SAM suggests developing habits for spending less than you earn and saving for future spending. When it comes to spending and savings, what habits have you formed and what habits do you need to work on? Do you follow a spending plan or the B word, budget? Do you spend less than you earn in a month? I, it's tough. Life happens. What percentage of income do you save each month? Have you made a goal? What do you do with windfalls such as a raise, bonus, or tax refund? 
Many people who feel financial secure use a spending plan, or the B word, budget. A spending plan helps you prioritize by sorting out your I want expenditures from your I need expenditures. By paying attention to what you buy each month, you quickly identify any leftover money, which can increase your retirement savings rate, emergency fund, and even your net worth. So on, on that same line about the book reviews, I actually, Rover.com, if you're very familiar with that, I actually have a couple of neighbors in my community that loves walking dogs. And she comes and we give her a little money to do that. And her her favorite hobby has turned into a lucrative business. So now she's able to say, hey, maybe I don't need that full-time job. We have a worksheet in your handouts. So please go ahead and um, check that out after the webinar. A simple rule of thumb many people like to use for budgeting is spent 50, 20, 30. So 50% of your take-home pay goes towards fixed expenses like your mortgage, your rent, utilities, or loan payments. 20% of your take-home pay goes towards savings for the future. And savings for the future could be your retirement, college, um, more education, starting a business. No more than 30% goes toward discretionary spending, your watts. Reduction in this kind of spending can be used to bolster your savings. So maybe it's time to give up that coffee. Maybe it's time to figure out a different strategy um, instead of buying books all the time. In reality, maybe many people fall far below this guideline. Many Americans report a personal savings rate of 6% well below the 20% guideline according to the study by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. How do your saving habit measure up to the 20% guideline? As a general guideline, your total consumer debt load, this includes credit cards, car loans, student loans, anything you pay monthly except for housing, should be less than 20% of your annual net after tax income. How do your spending habits measure up? Use a debt-to-income ratio calculator to assess your debt load. We recommend avoiding spending for an outward show or status and buying only what you can afford to repay in a short time frame. Following this guideline can boost your financial well-being by increasing your credit score, lowering your monthly debt obligations, and increasing your savings. So let's talk about protecting that money once you are accumulating. Insurance. The ability to absorb a financial shock to your property, health, life, or income is part of financial well-being. It's not always comfortable to think about a loss in any of these areas, but running scenarios can be helpful to prepare you when something bad happens. So for us here in Colorado, we just had a hit of hailstorms. Unfortunately for a lot of our neighbors, they have insurance to cover that. But we have, um, we have met a couple other neighbors who have said our insurance doesn't cover that and I don't know how to fix this problem. So insurance provides protection from financial loss and mitigates the risk that we all face at some time in our lives. Think about which insurance types you currently have. All right, so in terms of our goals, uh, we also have included a smart goals worksheet in your handouts. When we think about our goals, I think it can be helpful for us to identify short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals, and also using the SMART Goals Worksheet. So you want to make sure that your goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So I'm going to go through some examples of what short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals could look like in each of those three areas. So we've got our savings, our debt, and then in terms of how we're protecting our assets and our finances. So for the short term, you may want to just focus on gathering information. You may want to go ahead and get your credit score. And I do want to want to mention that you can order a free credit report at annualcreditreport.com. That's a resource that you can definitely take advantage of that's free of charge. You can pull your own free credit report once a year, and that comes from each of the three nationwide credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. So that might be your short-term goal, really focusing on gathering information and knowing where you're at financially. I think that's a really excellent first step. In terms of your savings, again, really, really want uh, to shout out the ability to automatically save from your paycheck. 
you may also want to consider maybe having your employer automatically deduct from your paycheck if you don't want to see it hit your account at all. So I think there are many ways that you can set up these automatic transfers, either through direct deposit or through automatic transfers in your online banking. So that's a short-term goal that any of us could give a try to today. In terms of debt, a short-term strategy to tackle your debt is understanding how long it might take to pay it off. So you can use a debt payment calculator to to determine how long it will take to eliminate a specific set of debt. Most, many of us have many different debts, and you can do that, you can try to do that for all of your debts, or you can tackle one at a time. In terms of protecting, evaluate your, own, your current protection. As Jeanette was mentioning, things like hailstorms, uh, tornadoes I saw happening in the Midwest yesterday, any of these things can, can happen, uh, you know, unexpectedly. So you really want to make sure that you know what kind of coverage you have and also how to make a claim. I think um, in addition to financial advisors, your, um, your insurance agent can also be a really good resource to you. So I, I think sometimes we don't, we don't take advantage of the, the wealth of knowledge and resources that are available to us. So we're paying for this insurance, but we don't really understand it your agent can really provide a lot of clarity and context in terms of what types of coverage that you have. All right, so let's go on to our midterm goals. So an idea for a midterm goal for your savings could be setting up a spending plan. So we do have a budget worksheet for you in your handouts, and that would allow you to think about, for two months, really establishing your budget and tracking your actual expenditures. This was something that I did a few years ago. I um. I never had really taken a look at how I was spending my money, and I did it for one month. I tracked all my spending, and one of the biggest takeaways from it was, my goodness, was I spending a lot on groceries. This was an area where I just, I would go to the grocery store and just, I mean, I had no budget. I didn't think about it, so I just buy whatever I thought I needed or what I wanted, and this was adding up. One day I looked up, what is like the average that a family of four would spend, and this was just two people, and I was spending well over that. So I, I realized I had to make a change. And my point in telling you that is there's a lot of benefits to actually taking a look at how you're tracking. If you, if you take the time to track your spending, I think you can learn a lot about where your money is going. So I recommend that as a midterm goal. For debt, uh, think about how you can raise your credit score. There's a lot of science on that. Um, and I think the Smart About Money website is a really great resource. There are specific courses that have to do with credit. And these are online courses, as we mentioned. You can do these courses at your own leisure, but um, there's a lot of resources out there in terms of strategies to imp improve your credit score. And these, this really does make a difference, particularly if you are thinking about um, a mortgage or some kind of a big um, loan. You really want to have a good, good credit score, and there are many ways you can, you can um, improve that over time. So that's why it's a midterm goal. In terms of protecting, uh, make sure that you're reviewing your insurance coverages and needs, and make sure that you're also getting a good price on your insurance. It's okay to shop around, and if you're in the position to, you can kind of think about comparing prices from several different insurance carriers and making sure that you're keeping the money, keeping as much of your money as you can. And then lastly, long-term goals. Thinking about your savings. So um, I would, I would really recommend that you think about. Think about where you can start to invest your money. Money sitting in a bank is safe, but it's not necessarily earning a lot of money for you. So think about how you can um, invest your money into an interest earning account and, um, and take advantage of some of those financial resources that are available. In terms of debt, a long-term goal would be learning to live below your means. And this really, this doesn't mean that you have to dep deprive yourself or that you're going to be living in poorly or anything like that, but I think it does mean that you're evaluating your choices and always considering the future consequences of your spending. And lastly, your long-term goal or an idea for a long-term goal in terms of your insurance could be thinking about that, um, the idea of long-term care insurance. So we will all be in the position at, at one time or another that we will need someone to care for us. So this is something that you you may want to look into if you already have not, and um, there are many long-term care policies that are out there. Awesome. So let's take a moment to reflect on all of what you've heard today, particularly about this section on, on goals. How confident are you in this moment 
about your ability to achieve a financial goal that you set for yourself today. Go ahead and type that into your questions box. We've got some, some suggested language, but feel free to add your own twist to it. We've got some confident people, a lot of people saying very confident, very confident, and I'm so glad to hear that. I know I personally was not always in the position where I would, where I even knew how to set a financial goal, so I think you saying that you're very confident says a lot about the work that you've done to get to that point, point. and um, I do want to emphasize that it's a journey. I don't think that, so we all have goals and they're always evolving, so it's important that we are constantly seeking out the right resources so that we can feel confident about the financial decisions we're making. Really good. Okay, so we've got a lot of confident people. There are some folks that are saying that they're somewhat confident, good, and I think as long as you're on that journey uh, is, really, is really what we want, and financial literacy and education is key. All right, so our last interactive session, section of today's webinar. So remembering that it's important not only to have goals, but also to measure your progress towards reaching those goals. So you may have already established some financial well-being goals for yourself, and you've thought about the short-term, medium, and long-term activities that you can work on for specific topics. We've, we've thought a lot about defining financial well-being, why we make the decisions we do, as well as what's behind our money values. So in this last interactive activity, you can complete this sentence. I will know when I have succeeded when blank. Or you can just generally type in, how will you monitor your progress towards the overall goal or action that you may have set? Go ahead and type that into the questions box. People are saying that they'll know when, they, when they've achieved success when they can retire comfortably and they're able to meet all their needs. When they have a Roth IRA set up, that is something you could do in the short term. Go ahead and go and talk to a financial advisor and they'll give you a lot of information. When your credit score starts going up, when meeting basic needs is no longer the primary focus, really good. I like that, that hierarchy of needs reference and putting that in the financial context I think is really powerful. I will know I have succeeded when I feel peace with my choices and have savings. When I have established a fixed amount of savings, yeah, savings is a big theme here. I, yeah, savings, we really love it. When your credit score is excellent, yes, and it can get there. Yeah. Learning how to use credit cards, I think, is a really powerful tool. Our next webinar, I just want to shout out, is about income spending and savings. So you will be hearing more and more detailed about, you know, credit cards, thinking about savings. So definitely tune in to our next financial education webinar. All right. Um, this has been awesome. I have truly, really appreciated all of the um, the interactive and all of your comments. I think it, they're really informative in terms of where you all are at and um, how you are relating to this material. So thank you so much. Let's go ahead on to the next. So we mentioned a lot of different websites throughout the webinar, but we want to have one PowerPoint for you to take away with. So here are some awesome money management resources, all sponsored by nonprofit organizations. First and foremost is the National Endowment for Financial Education, www.nefi.org. My personal project is financialworkshopkits.org. If you sign up for the newsletter, you'll see all the different things that are coming up in the, um, in the year. It's free to you four times a year, so we don't really bug you any more than four times a year. And, and the upcoming issue will be uh, a detailed history and explanation of our partnership and collaboration with the, ne the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Smartaboutmoney.org was mentioned um, many times during this webinar. And it seems like MyRetirementPaycheck.org is a, a good one for a lot of uh, the attendees out there. CommunityActionPartnership.com is another resource that you should take a look at. They have a lot of different uh, resources that you can share and provide tips to your clients and people you serve. And we also mentioned MissionAssetFund.org when we talked about the hierarchy of needs. Don't forget annualcreditreport.com, too. We mentioned that. We will include all these websites in the follow-up email to go out 24 hours after the end of this session. 
Awesome. And um, to wrap up for today's webinar, I just want to remind everyone about the next three. So on the on the bottom half of that graphic on the screen, you, you can see the dates as well as the topics for all of our upcoming financial education webinars. And if you need additional information on that, go ahead and visit ncadv.org slash financial dash education. Otherwise, you can search on the NCADB site for all, for finan the financial education page. And registration is open in advance for all of those webinars. So feel free to go ahead and sign up for any of those additional webinars, including webinar four, which is on income, spending, and savings, which I mentioned. We also have a webinar on planning for the holidays and setting financial goals. I think this one's pretty exciting. That'll be good. And then our last webinar in the series focuses on retirement planning for survivors and advocates. And we, we included this one in the series because I think that in our field, we don't often talk about the importance of retirement planning. And um, so we wanna recognize that you may be working with an organization that maybe doesn't provide a, a retirement fund or it doesn't provide that opportunity. And if they do, they may not be matching your contributions. So thinking in terms of how you as an individual and as an advocate or a survivor can Think about your retirement planning needs. All right, so a reminder that you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow, which will include a link to a recording of this webinar, as well as a link to all of the handouts that were referenced and a certificate of participation. We value your feedback. So if you have a moment, please do fill out the five question survey. It'll probably take you less than five minutes. And we would really love to hear from you so that we can improve. Each year, you know, we take a lot of time to plan and um, really put a lot of consideration and thought into the topics we choose. But we want your feedback in terms of what topics would you like to see us cover in the future? How did you feel about this particular content? And thank you all in advance for your feedback. We appreciate it. And then lastly, to wrap up, we, um, we want to shout out our National Conference on Domestic Violence, which will take place in September of this year, September 23rd through the, through the 26th. Registration is open, and um, the pricing will go up at the end of July, so keeping that in mind, if you are interested in attending the National Conference on Domestic Violence hosted by NCADB, please visit ncadb.org slash conference to register. Uh, we'll stay on just for a couple more minutes, but we will stop the recording at this point, but we'll stay on if anybody has any specific questions. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your afternoon.